Hello everybody and welcome back to Desert DIY. If you are new here, my name is Corey. Today I'm starting off by showing you my garage which is jam-packed full of projects and tools and repurposing items, fabrics, jars, <laughs> stains, paints, tools, whatever you can think of it's in here. And my goal for the upcoming year is to completely clean out this garage and be able to park my cars in it. So in order for me to do that, I need to get these projects done. So I spent a couple days getting a lot finished. We pulled out some of the bigger items that I wanted to work on today and brought them into the driveway just so I could give you guys an overview of some of the big things that we're gonna get done. This cabinet I got from my mom. She bought it from an antique mall a long time ago for 175 bucks and I am going to be giving it a restore but not refinish. I wanna still see all the little nicks and bumps and bruises on it to help tell its story of where it's been. This thing is over 100 years old. The next piece, you might remember this from my last video where I showed you my thrift haul. I got this for five bucks from Goodwill. It was half off of $9.99 and I'm going to redo those to match these chairs right here. These chairs I got from an antique mall. I showed them to you in that same video. It looks like somebody's butt went right through the seats on these things. So I'm going to be doing something I've never done before, which is using upholstery webbing to recreate these seats right here. The lamp has some issues that I think I can fix though, so don't worry. This piece I got from a yard sale for $5. It is completely solid marble, very heavy, but super duper wobbly. So I'm going to address how I fixed that in the video. When we first got it, we thought that there would be like some kind of bolt that we could tighten down that had a rod going through all of the pieces of this, but it turns out that it's not a bolt, it's some kind of nail head piece. I don't know exactly how this works, so I'm going to get creative. But the first piece I'm going to start working on is this old china cabinet. Somebody had put a, um, a latch on here to lock it, I imagine, so that little ones couldn't get in there and break their special breakable things. So I'm gonna take that off and give it back its original look of having a nice flat front without any weird hardware on there and fill in all the holes with some wood filler from the things that they had screwed in. The next thing I need to do is sand down this entire piece to get it ready to restain it. A really cool hack that you guys could do with your own antiques you have at home if they just need some refreshing of the stain is hand sand it and then go back over it with the same stain color that it was originally. These pieces in the desert dry out really badly and this hack works really well. So I'm just using 220 grit and I'm hand sanding it since this piece is very delicate and something really interesting about it is that all the glass on this is wavy glass so that means it is from between 1870 to 1930. I would imagine based on the style and the delicateness of this piece that it's probably from the early 1900s. I don't see any hand carved things on here so I don't think that it's from the 1800s but I would guess somewhere around 1900 to 1910. If you are good at dating antique furniture leave a comment below and let me know what your guess is as to the age of this piece.
Once I'm done sanding, I just took a microfiber cloth and got all the dust off of the piece before my husband came in and put on the stain. Since I'm pregnant, I can't be around that kind of wood stain. It is an oil-based and is very smelly. And if you've been watching my channel for a while, you might already know this about me, but I am actually allergic to wood stain. It gives me a lot of um, like sinus allergy reactions. My nose runs like crazy and I'll get a sore throat for the entire rest of the day after being around it for only a few minutes. So he's going to step in and do that part for me and make sure that it gets stained up really nice. You guys know that he is very good at what he does. He's very detail oriented. The color that we stained it with was ebony. The original color on this was probably a dark mahogany. But since it was left somewhere, probably in storage, I would imagine, somewhere really, really hot, it baked this piece and gave it something called an alligator finish, which is where it has like almost scale like a skin to it, like an alligator, like um, reptilian looking, <laughs> because the stain kind of uh, melted and then dried back up and shrank, creating all those cracks. So. It made the stain a lot darker when it did that and it made it almost black in some areas so in order to just give it a stain that will work on the entire piece covering up those darker black areas and also blending in the dark mahogany we went with ebony if you want a perfectly refinished look you would have to sand this piece down to its bare wood but i caution you against that as somebody who was raised watching Antiques Roadshow with my grandmother every single week, they always say not to make it look brand new because it will lose its value. So instead, you are just going to condition it and embrace the beauty of all the imperfections because you cannot recreate 120 years of use and taking that away would be such a huge shame. Another thing that just wasn't working on this piece was that the wheels were broken. It was missing two wheels. It still had the brackets for the wheels, but the wheels themselves had broken and disappeared and the wheel brackets were extremely rusted and they'd be unsafe to put a new wheel on anyways just because that metal would probably disintegrate. <laughs> so in the future, we could easily put new wheels on there, but I really don't think this piece needs to have wheels. In fact, I'd rather it not be able to be pushed around considering how much glass is on it and will be inside it. I just put some felt pads over the area where the wheels went inside. I don't want to get rid of that original area where you would insert those wheels into in case somebody in the future wants to put wheels back on it and restore it. But for me, I didn't want the wheels, so I'm just putting the felt pads on there. That way it doesn't scratch up my wood floors. The last step is just to clean the glass. This is very thin, wavy glass, and my husband is being extra careful. He's using a shop towel and some Windex to clean the stain that got on the glass. After a full day of drying and airing it out, this is how it turned out. I apologize for the dark lighting in my house. We don't have a lot of windows in this house, so it's a bit dark. But I love the texture that this piece still has. You can still see the age of the piece. You can still see its story that it has been through some stuff in the last 120 some years. 
and the dark ebony turned into a very beautiful black stain just like I thought it would and it really suits this piece and makes the things that you put inside it stand out. I personally love blue and white dishes and ginger jars so that is what I decorated it with but let me know in the comments down below what you would put in a china cabinet like this. Moving on to the next project, I'm going to tackle these two chairs. I've been looking forward to doing these chairs for a long time. I love this style of chairs. You often see this kind of style recreated these days at a store called Kirkland's or other really high-end stores. And I was always inspired by the stuff they had in there, but I wanted to get it at a much cheaper price. So these chairs I spent $20 a piece on and then I added some padding, the, the chair webbing and things like that and it was still maybe a fourth of what I would have spent getting them from a store like Kirkland's. The old caning was really easy to remove. I just used a razor blade and cut the edges and pulled it right out. I have looked everywhere for the upholstery webbing that I bought on Amazon for this chair and I can't find it now. So now I have to go to Joann's and get some more. Okay, made it to Joann's. I found the chair webbing that I was looking for. I originally bought it off Amazon. I think I spent a little more on Amazon, I'm not sure. But I was concerned I wasn't going to be able to find it anywhere and I looked online and found out that Joann's had it in my store near me, sort of near me, <laughs> and I went and picked it up right away because they only had a few left of the ones that I wanted. But they have a lot of other choices here so I just wanted to show you that. And also they had some really cute peel and stick contact paper that I want to try in the future. Some of it was really pretty and I just wanted to share that with you in case you didn't know they had that at Joann's. I already knew what fabric I wanted to use, which I also got from Joann's a while ago. It is actually a blue and white that you see right here. It's kind of like a navy grayish blue. But I saw another one that I thought would do better. Not this one, I just want to show you this because it's cute. But I found another one that I thought would look better to match the lamp that I'm trying to match it to. And I decided to go with that one which has a burlapy brown color to it as you can see right here. By the time I got done going to Joann's, getting food and eating with the kids and finishing school and all that mom stuff that I have to do every day, it, the sun was already going down so you'll see that it is kind of dark in the background here. It was around 6 o'clock the sun started going down. But all you need to know about doing this chair webbing from what I learned doing it for the first time, obviously I'm not an expert since I'm doing it for the first time, but you just need to staple it really, really well. You want to fold over the edges before you staple it too to make it even stronger. And then you're going to weave the, the panels here like a basket again for added strength.
The next step is I need to get the wrinkles out of the fabric that I got from Joann's. I'm using my steamer because I can't find my iron at the moment, which has me totally furious. <laughs> But this steamer was a Con Air brand, just in case you want to try one out. I have it linked in my Amazon store. The next thing I'm going to do is use some spray adhesive to get my foam padding to stick to the chair. And FYI, my husband and I both tested out the, the webbing that we put in to make sure that it was strong enough. I weigh about 160 pounds. My husband weighs about 200 pounds. And both of us could sit in these chairs with no issues. Um, and it, was, it held up really, really well. After the padding was cut to the right shape, I went over it with some quilt batting. The quilt batting helps to disguise any sharp shapes, corners, edges, weird cuts, things like that, and give it a smooth finish. I folded up a little bit of the batting and put it in the center of the seat just to help raise that center to make sure it wasn't going to dip when the fabric was on there. Nothing worse than a, a <laughs> saggy looking seat that dips in the middle. So I wanted to make sure that wasn't going to happen. Then I just take my staple gun and stapled all the way around the batting to hold that padding down and make sure everything looked nice and smooth and even and then cut all the edges off of the batting. And I'm going to do the exact same thing with the fabric once I get to that step too. I was exhausted after all of that and I decided to wait to do the rest until the morning. So this is the next morning and now I have cut the fabric to a decent size to fit the seat and lined up those stripes nice and straight so that way I don't have a weird crooked looking seat. And then I just stapled it on the same way that I did everything else that I had just showed you. The final step for these chairs is adding the piping to the edges to cover all the staples and the edge of the fabric. I'm going to be using a jute twine, one because I'm trying to match that burlap lampshade of that lamp so that these pieces match together, and two because I feel like it would really go with that look that I have here with like a French country farmhouse look when it's got that natural burlapy jute colored edging on it. The method I used to attach it was just to use some Sherbonder hot glue. Sherbonder is really, really strong hot glue. I love this type of hot glue. I like it better than even the Gorilla brand hot glue. It's just really good quality and I like that my glue gun from Sherbonder, it has a really fine tip on it which makes it easier to apply it without getting goo everywhere. <laughs> I'm not sponsored or anything. I paid for this with my own money. And I'll link one in my Amazon store for you guys if you want to check it out.
Now, before I reveal these chairs both finished together, I want to get the lamps done so that I can reveal it all together since I want them to match. The lampshade was super crooked and it was a outdated brass color. I know some people really enjoy brass. I am not somebody who likes brass a whole lot, especially if it's not like real brass. <laughs> it's just a brass look. And so I wanted to go with something totally different on this. I just moved and bent and turned that piece until it got straight. And then I cleaned the whole piece down with some Lysol wipes before I decided to paint it. I'm going to use chalk paint for this and this is by Rust-Oleum. I love Rust-Oleum products in general, but my mom actually gave this to me when she moved into her new house. She was downsizing all her things and she said that she wasn't going to use this chalk paint anymore and so of course I said yes. White paint in general is something I go through tons of with doing my DIYs for my channel. So I'm almost always going to say yes to white paint whether it's chalk paint or not. As long as it's water-based, usually I'm like, yes, give me all the white paint. <laughs> Something fun I'm going to do for this dark brown cord is I'm going to cover it in some tan yarn and I'm doing it in just a knot tying method and I just tie a knot around the, the very base of where the wire meets the lamp just to hold my, my string still and then I wrap it twice and tie a knot and then pull it tight and I just redo that over and over and over again until the whole cord is covered and my oldest daughter saw me doing this and wanted to try it out. So I let her try it out um, for a good portion of it. And she got a lot of it done for me. And I think that letting your kids experiment and try things like this is really important. It helps them to discover what their creative abilities are. And then later on in their life, like what if one day she has a lamp with an ugly cord? She can know exactly what she can do to make that cord look nice again. And all that I had left to do after a couple coats of white paint and finishing covering that cord was put that light bulb back in which it came with how lucky am I <laughs> and then put the lampshade back on and it was on there nice and straight now so I didn't have that funky crooked look going on with it. Something really neat about this lamp is that it has a dimmer on it. So it, it it's not just like an off and on switch. It actually dims all the way down and all the way back up. And here is that cord covered. It's not perfect and I let, let you guys know my daughter did a lot of this and she had never done it before. So she was practicing and it turned out really awesome and I just love the story of it. And here are the chairs. I adore these chairs. And I'm considering keeping them. I'm not sure where I'd put them though. That's the only problem. And this lamp has already found a home that it's going to be donated to. I got an email saying that there was somebody who urgently needed some furniture. So that lamp is going to be in that group. Now it's time to work on this marble plant stand, I guess, this pedestal. And all I'm going to do for this is something really, really simple. I'm going to use a universal glue called E6000. And I'm going to glue all of the cracks kind of like in a caulking method to make it to where it doesn't wiggle and shift anymore. And that's all that I had to do to fix this piece. Check another one off the list. This one is finished. I have a really funny story to share with you guys about my next projects that are coming up. 
I had bid on a set of three baskets and I'll show you what it looked like when I bid on them, like the picture that I bid on right now. I won the bid for $3. I thought a dollar per basket, you can't beat that. And then I had already gone out and shopped for some florals that I wanted to put in one of them. I asked my husband to go pick them up while I was getting some school done with my kids and he called me 10 minutes after leaving and said, I just blew my tire on the freeway. And I'm thinking like all the scary things that could happen, of course, you know, worrier like I am. And so I tell him, don't change the tire. Let's get your truck towed home and then you can change it at home because I've just heard way too many stories about people getting run over on the side of the freeway, especially where we live. I don't know why it just happens a lot. And so um, he called the tow truck that was going to take two and a half hours and it's covered by insurance, but he just didn't want to sit there for two and a half hours, which is still dangerous to sit on the side of the freeway in your car. So then I called the highway patrol and asked if they could have a squad car come and just park behind him with the lights on to help protect him from getting run over so he can change his tire there on the freeway. And he's still waiting for that to happen right now. And I told him just, you know, just be safe. I'd rather be safe than sorry. I don't care how long it takes for them to get there to help you. It's better that you're safe. So then I'm on my way to pick up this, the auction stuff that I bought. And I apologize to them when I get there. I'm so sorry I'm late. And the tell them the whole story of how my husband's tire blew and all that good stuff. And I'm standing there waiting for them to pull out my stuff from their warehouse and this lady comes out with the biggest basket I've ever seen in my entire life and I'm going to show you right now what it looks like and <laughs> I just can't this is one of those things where you should really read the description about the size of the pieces you're picking up because this almost did not fit in my full-size SUV Here's one of the smaller ones, which was still way bigger than I thought it was going to be based on the picture. And then here's the massive, huge, world's largest basket. Biggest basket ever made in the world. <laughs> Why would somebody make a basket this big? What would you even put in there? Everything? I, <laughs> at this point, you can put anything in it. But I decided to use it for one of my Christmas trees because I knew that it would help lift my tree up high so that way my toddler could not reach the bulbs because these ones are glass bulbs and I didn't want him to reach them to break them. So I think this was the perfect application for a basket that was meant for a hot air balloon. <laughs> and it looks really nice in my uh, beautiful dining room, my formal dining room. But I feel like the table was missing something. So my next project is going to be a table runner that I'm going to make that will match my Christmas decorations. And I'm making it out of some fabric that I picked up from Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby has the cheapest velvet fabric that I could find anywhere. And it is very high quality, even higher quality than the velvet that I found at Joann's in the upholstery section, which should be really high quality. And the piece I got, I think, was three yards because I know I'm going to want to use it for other projects in the future. And it could have been a tablecloth <laughs> the way that it was. But I wanted a table runner because I like the feature on my table where I have glass so that it's really easy to clean after we're done eating. With having three kids, almost four kids, it's, it's always best if something's really easy to keep clean. Since it was such a high quality fabric, I didn't even have to sew the edges because when you cut that edge, it's just a perfect finished edge already. The only thing I had to do was trim it a little bit shorter because it was a little too long for my table. Now I want to put some candles on the table. I bought these clear glass candlesticks from the thrift store, although you can find similar ones at a dollar store and I paid like 40 cents each for mine. And then my mom gifted me these two white ones and I felt like it was too much white in the room and I thought that the white and the glass kind of didn't go well together so I decided that we should paint them gold so first my husband spray painted them in this champagne gold 
and I didn't really like how that turned out. So I went over them with my gold leaf color um, rub and buff, which is like a very solid colored metallic wax. And you just apply it on and let it cure and it is a really, really um, like solid color. You only have to do one coat to make it look like something is made of gold. And I thought that this gold color was perfect and it went along with the star on top of my tree and it will work for lots of holidays in the future. Thank you all so much for coming to hang out with me today while I got all of this stuff done off my list. I am really excited for the next projects that I'm going to finish and I know you guys are going to really like those too. I'm going to try and do more compilation videos like this where I have lots of projects put together in one video for you. So if you want to see that, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you want to see some of my past projects, if you are new to my channel maybe, I'll have some videos linked at the end of this video for you to check out. Thanks so much for watching! Bye!